is um, our community outreach arm for the College of Pharmacy. And we have collectively, um, probably over 10 or 12 years, uh, provided a lot of education and served as a bridge for researchers and diverse communities in regards to research recruitment and retention. And so this evening, you'll get a chance to appreciate his talent, um, both as a pharmacist, um, as well as a, a, a semi-microbiologist of sort. And we're going to talk about COVID affairs. Um, as I mentioned, We Care is our community outreach arm. And because we're reaching out to the community, we collaborate with Reach Up Incorporated. And we're fortunate to have Dr. Deborah Austin, who is the Director of Community Outreach for Reach Up with us this evening. And they have facilitated all of the technology and registration um, pieces for this meeting. And so I'd like to introduce to you all Dr. Deborah Austin. And uh, she also has a staff member, Mr. Michael Morgan, who is uh, also with us this evening. So we're very grateful for them. We have another team member, um, Mr. Haim Green, who I think just hasn't joined us yet, and we'll introduce him a little later. Um, so again, we Mr. can- Mr. Andre uh, is also here. Oh, is she? Okay. Well, I also definitely like to introduce um, Mrs. Andre. Mrs. Andre serves as um, pretty much our research coordinator. And so she works with our community advisory uh, board in terms of helping us evaluate the um, ability or plausibility of research studies so that we can collaborate with researchers and assist in either recruitment and or a retention of the studies. And we do see a lot of uh, familiar faces. I'm not sure, Ms. Andre, if you want to turn your camera on um, and just say hello to everyone, or you can turn your mic on and say hello. I will turn my mic on. I actually have COVID. I got <gasps> tested on, yep, I got tested on Saturday and I'm positive and I reached out to Dr. Sneed and I was able to get yesterday at Tampa General Hospital the, um, um, the antibodies infusion. And so I got that done yesterday. So I will not be turning my camera on because I'm laying in bed and I'm very tired. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I still wanted to tune in and, and see what the, the latest presentation is and um, be here with everybody who's here to learn from Dr. Sneed. So thank you very much for the introduction, but I am very tired. <laughs> okay. well, we, we really are wishing you um, wellness immediately. And we're just so grateful that you're with us and, and such a valuable part of our team. So you've got to hurry up and, and get better. <laughs> So we do see a couple of names that we're familiar with. Um, we, we are going to put Mr. Webb in our groupie category and Mrs. Perchel Jackson. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we're going to start keeping tabs, Dr. Sneed, and give them some extra points for um, frequent attendance to these meetings. Um, but we would like to suggest that if you have a device that you could share um, the link with through email or however, um, send it out to people because tonight's going to be a special treat. I also see Mrs. Pat Sanders, I'm one of our national community partners. And so we're really excited to have each and every one of you all here. And I think you, you are going to really enjoy tonight's program. I'm sure all of you have paid attention to the news um, and heard about, unfortunately, the pause in the J&J &J vaccines being distributed from some of, the, um, at some of the centers in the United States. Unfortunately, there have been six noted deaths. And so Dr. Sneed will be elaborating a little bit more on that. Um, and we'll talk also about other vaccines and allow, most importantly, opportunities for you all to ask questions. Um, and that's what these workshops are set up for, for you to ask questions from a, a reputable source and a trusted source. And as I've mentioned earlier, We Care has been around. Um, we worked with Moffitt, AHEC, the College of Public Health, and other entities formally through a health equity center, um, focusing on on cancer disparities. And then Dr. Sneed, after that funding was over, decided to rebirth the effort and philosophy, but expand upon it through We Care, which stands for Work Group Enhancing Community Advocacy and Research Engagement. And so as time permits, we'll share with you a little later um, a little short video that tells you more about We Care, but just so that we can hurry up 
depth and get to your questions, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Sneed this evening. So I've had the fortunate opportunity of knowing Dr. Sneed professionally, collectively now going on 20 or more years. And it has been a pleasure to serve under him as um, the founding chair for the Tunisia College of Pharmacy um, and now transitioned into my role as associate clinical dean. But never have I had um, a dean who has been as visionary, as integral, and certainly qualified and true to the profession of pharmacy. He still practices um, um, probably a little bit more than me now because of the, the pandemic. Um, he has been extremely involved involved with all things related to COVID care, um, and you'll appreciate that. But Dr. Snead received his pharmacy degree from Xavier University. He actually started out his uh, college education at, at University of Florida a, 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 on his route to becoming a very, very famous quarterback, and then unfortunately experienced an in, uh, injury that transitioned him to the University of Central Florida. And while there, he got a degree in microbiology. And so that is what kind of qualifies him to talk to us tonight about um, COVID, because he has uh, really invested a lot of time um, since the pandemic, particularly, and staying on top of the literature. So many of you have probably seen him on TV or, or her radio um, interviews or other um, workshops where he shared his insights on what's going on, not only with the virus, but certainly um, treatment, research, and, and definitely the vaccine. And so one of the other things about Dr. Sneed is that he is an ambulatory care specialist and he has provided care to patients in the Marsani um, I think it's fan. You're working with family health, right, Dr. Sneed? Yeah, yeah, yeah family, family medicine. medicine family medicine department and primarily from um, he's a metabolic syndrome specialist but he's worked with patients with disorders ranging from anticoagulation disorders to diabetes and the like so any topic related to chronic care management dr sneed is definitely um, a clinician who's highly respected within usf health as well as in the pharmacy profession and so this evening without further ado i'll introduce to you my boss, my colleague, and my friend. And um, certainly, again, we do want you to be thinking of questions. If you want to go ahead and put them in the chat, go ahead. Um, and if he answer, says something and you have additional questions, feel free. But we hope to have plenty, spend plenty of time um, talking and answering your questions this evening. So Dr. Sneed, I'll let you take it from there. Uh, well, well doc, Dr. Hill, thank you very much. I, I know you're asking me for that $1 million raise for that very kind um, uh, introduction that you always give me, and and uh, I, I promise you, if if uh, if our financial fortunes change, uh, you you'll be right in line to get it. But well, um, I'm glad I have 27 <laughs> witnesses. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but in any event, uh, tonight is really going to be uh, just. I want to get through the presentation. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for for being here. I really want to thank Dr. Austin. And um, just for being a, a wonderful community partner, we were, we've been partnering long before COVID-19. And I would also like for all of you to know and be aware that uh, we've been doing these presentations uh, since May and June of last year in 2020. Long before anyone knew that we were even going to need to do them and get out to the community, we've been doing uh, COVID education. Uh, we began doing COVID vaccine presentations uh, back in June and July of last year, really helping people understand a lot more. So tonight, of course, we've had a, a very exciting um, uh, almost 12 hours now uh, of hearing about the Johnson & Johnson uh, challenges with their vaccine. I'll be here to answer questions. And, and I really just spend quite a bit of time today with our scientists here uh, kind of unpacking and, and providing uh, my insight and thoughts and then gathering their insight and thoughts. And I'll do whatever I can uh, to try and provide that. But I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as you often hear in the airline industry, I want you to buckle up and hold on tight because we, we're gonna go fairly quick. Uh, now, I just want to also share with you, and before, well, before I share, let me, let me do this one thing. Yeah, um, the presentation is very visual. Uh, there's a lot of movement, there's uh, animation. I didn't wanna, I, I never put a bunch of words up for the public, um, but I'm here to try and spark a thought, a question answer anything you may have seen on, on social media. 
and try and dispel and do away with much of the misinformation that has gone on, but I'm really here to address it. Uh, our We Care team, we were on last evening with a uh, primarily Hispanic group uh, here in the Tampa Bay area until about 10 o'clock in the evening, uh, answering their questions. Uh, I don't anticipate we'll be on that long tonight. The presentation will take probably about 20 to 25 minutes, and then the Q&A is really where we want to begin uh, having a, a more concerted conversation. But part of our goal right now is to begin to talk with you all, and then we're going to continue talking with younger people because uh, many younger people right now are the ones that have uh, surprisingly uh, turned out to be a little bit more hesitant, but, uh, but we're gonna try and uh, try and work on that. So uh, let me go ahead and share uh, my screen here. And I'm going to, I'm gonna do that. Okay, uh, Dr. Hill, can you confirm that you can you can see see the presentation? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to start off with a couple of very quick animated videos here, um, and I'm going to I'm going to stop and pause it in just a few uh, locations during that video, just to kind of make uh, various points for you. This is one of my first pause, pauses right here. Uh, this eventually kills the host cell. We're going to come back to that, but I want you all to implant that on your brain just for a quick moment. So here's an actual photograph of the, of the coronavirus. And what the green part is, is an actual single cell in your body. And the little yellow spots you see there are the coronavirus. So when we're talking about millions and millions and millions of copies of that particular virus potentially overrunning your organs and your system, this gives an actual photograph. This photograph came out of the lab of Dr. Fauci and the NIH. It's really important to understand when I'm saying a photograph, this was electron microscopy, much in the same way that we all take photographs with our iPhones. Uh, we have very powerful microscopes that can do the very same thing. And so just wanted to make sure that people understand because there are people still to this day uh, questioning whether or not the virus is real. Now I have another brief video uh, here that we're gonna show that, that kind of has a little bit more narration to it, but really begins to explain a little bit more about how these particular uh, coronaviruses now get into your cells and, what, and the, uh, the, the challenges that they can create for the infected person. In a world where millions of lives are under threat due to COVID-19, it is of vital importance to gain a better understanding of how the virus actually works in search of a cure. The surface of the virus particle is covered with approximately 100 spike proteins. They always come in groups of three, in which the proteins are intertwined. Each individual protein consists of two parts, a globular head called S1 and a stalk-like structure called S2. One of the three heads is slightly bent, enabling it to connect to the so-called ACE2 receptor on a human cell. 
once the connection between the virus and the receptor has been established, the human body activates the TMPRSS2 enzyme. This is a protein cutting enzyme that proceeds to cut off the head of the spike protein. This causes a change in the structure of the virus. The S2 protein now grows longer, penetrating the human cell. The protein then retracts again, bringing the membranes of the virus and the cell very close to one another. At this point, the virus can enter the cell through a process of endocytosis. It engulfs the cell with its membrane. The virus has successfully invaded the cell and can now start to multiply, ready to overrun the system. However, we have strong defence mechanisms that try to prevent this from happening at all costs. Scientists recently discovered how our antibodies react. It's actually a very simple process. Our antibodies bind to the spike head, or S1. I'm only pausing you right here because when you hear about the variance and the mutations, this is part of what they're talking about. So again, I hope that will spark another question, and I'll be very happy to talk about that, but well, we're going to keep going here. Thereby preventing it from connecting with the ACE2 receptor and stopping the virus from spreading. Understanding exactly how this process takes place is key to the rapid development of a vaccine, making it an essential part of our ongoing fight against this global public health crisis. So every human being on the planet, okay, all 7 billion of us, we have this receptor that you just heard about called the ACE2 receptor. It's very important to understand this is exactly the entry point that the, um, that the novel coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, attaches onto to gain entry into many of our cells. I'm going to show you in just a moment exactly where all these receptors are in our body. Now, I want all of you to imagine that the red spike protein on the outside of the virus is very much like Velcro and that the ACE2 receptor on that cell is very much like a sweater. And you all can imagine exactly how sticky it would be to have Velcro attach onto your sweater and, and potentially how damaging it could be to try and pull it off. So it's very sticky. And so it's very important to understand that when we're talking about the antibodies and trying to fight this particular virus, we are trying to prevent it from gaining entry into your cell so it can further replicate. Here, I kind of took another photograph, a still photograph of what you just saw, because when that virus gets inside of your body and inside of that cell, it now has the capability of using all of the proteins in that particular cell to replicate and build thousands of other copies of itself, eventually emerging from that cell, destroying that cell, and then going on to infect other parts of either that organ or other organs in the body. And so here are, here are the organs where you find that ACE2 receptor. Again, the ACE2 receptor is what the virus is attaching onto. Here you can see it, we have it in the heart, uh, the intestinal tract. Of course, we've all heard about it being in the lungs and very often on television, we see people who are going into the ICU, they're having coughing, they've been intubated, they have trouble breathing, they're on respirators and so on and so forth. But as you also see, there aren't a whole lot of, of um, expression of those ACE2 receptors in the lung, but the lung has such a big surface area that that's why we find it uh, causing so much of a problem for many people when it causes that, um, that COVID pneumonia. The one that really concerns me happens to be the kidneys and also some of the sexual organs in some of our uh, patients. Now here I'm showing you exactly what happens when that COVID uh, virus attaches on, what, what happens to the organ and what happens to you as a patient? Uh, on, the, on the left side, the neurological conditions, okay, the headache, the dizziness, uh, we, we hear about the brain fog. Uh, we've heard about people that lose sense of uh, smell and taste. We hear about all of that. Also, uh, I just talked about the kidney injury, but I want to bring your attention to the far right. Uh, about uh, April uh, of last year, we really began hearing about uh, these very significant and severe clotting mechanisms that were being uh, uh, found in many of the patients, uh, starting up in the Philadelphia area, moving right up through that corridor into New York City. And, um, and each time, and it was being reported in, in journals like New England Journal of Medicine and other journals, we were finding that this clotting was happening in so many different areas of the body, leading to DVT, clots traveling and, and depositing into the lungs, even depositing under the skin. And then finally, uh, as far as this particular slide, you know, we talk about uh, the heart. 
th this virus can attach onto heart cells, as I just showed you, and it can lead to very significant um, conditions like myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart and other um, uh, irregular heartbeat or arrhythmias of the heart. Now, the only reason I put this cartoon in, once again, is to help you understand that when that cell gets inside of your body, it will unfurl, and then that little RNA strand right there encircled by red, that is what now drives everything about that, that virus to gather proteins from inside of that cell and replicate. And so one may go in, but hundreds and even thousands are going to come out. And eventually, because it's gathering so much of that protein inside of that, that cell, it will eventually wind up potentially killing that cell of that organ. So it's really important to understand that uh, what we're trying to do is prevent entry of the cell and in many other cases, and I don't have time to go into all of the various medications uh, that you see here, but we, are, we, we clearly want to acknowledge and understand that other medications that are now being in development uh, and, and, and being tested are also designed to try and prevent the, uh, the RNA from getting into the cell, gathering up all these proteins and then exiting the cell. Now, this is uh, something brand new that my team uh, just saw last evening for the first time. Uh, and this is especially for many of our young people. When we've been telling people, uh, you know, for over a year now that we want to shut down restaurants, we don't want people in enclosed areas. Uh, let me, I'm going to show you a quick video and then I'll, I'll pause the video in, in the next uh, slide and show you exactly what winds up happening with, with just one infected individual. This is an animated portion of a study that was done out of China where they were actually going through and looking at the air currents inside of a restaurant. There were about 80 people in this particular restaurant. If you look towards the very top of all the people around the seats, you see one uh, animated figure in purple. That was the individual that was infected. That one single person was infected and, and came into the restaurant. So let me go ahead and push play, and then we might have to play this a couple of different times so you can kind of get the full effect. So here you're watching this red plume occur, uh, and it's part of that red plume that they found out that all the people that were on that side of the restaurant, uh, not, well, not all of them, but many of them actually became infected. So all the people that had now have a uh, red uh, head those individuals through contact tracing were found to have been affected by the one individual there in purple. Now, interestingly enough, only those individuals on that side of this particular location were actually infected. Nobody else in the entire restaurant became infected. But what they did find, and I'll show it here in just a moment, so I'm gonna play that again. So now they kind of, you know, they did a spray test where they were looking at the total air currents across the entire restaurant and did find in this location, when that one person aerosolized the, the virus and put it up into the air, the number of people and how far away they were from each other, how that one person wound up infecting a fair and large number of people that were nowhere near the individual. So here's another portion of the animated video. And here on the far right, again, you can see the individual in purple and all the people that were located in what we call table A, table B, and table C. Again, people at each one of those locations, not everybody, but um, a fair number of them became infected. And so what has gone into what we, when we're telling people to be careful and cautious about restaurants, when we shut down the bars and, and grills all across the entire country, it was this kind of research that was leading us to better understand how the virus was traveling inside of closed spaces, okay? And that, and that closed space could be a church, uh, as we found out in Washington of last year, when 60 members uh, walked into a church and about 48 became infected, four died. Uh, it can be, in, again, in restaurants, it can be in schools. So again, just want to help you all better understand and appreciate why we were doing this. It wasn't just because people woke up and thought about it. There was actual research, and, and this is just one indicator of the type of research people were doing to figure out how widespread uh, the virus can go when it's inside of a building. Now, for people that have chronic cardiovascular conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, especially those that fall into the obesity and overweight category, just by virtue of having that condition, you have the potential to build inflammatory proteins inside of your body. If you were to become infected, and you see that here on the right, the, 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 the coronavirus has the potential to lead to further uh, enhancement of these, these inflammatory proteins leading to what we call a cytokine storm. 
the cytokine storm has great potential to cause damage to many organs in the body, depending on where it's happening. So again, we're, uh, when we're wondering and, and trying to figure out, you know, if you're diabetic, why are you more susceptible for death? If you have high blood pressure, uh, the, the, the World, World Health Organization actually came out and talked about the number of people that fell into the obesity category. A large number of people who have died from COVID-19 fell into the, into the over, at least overweight category. And again, it's all happening because this inflammation, when it comes into contact with this particular virus, and it turns on these inflammatory proteins leading to further organ damage, it really does begin to explain why we can't, we have such difficulty saving people even when we get them to the hospital. I'm uh, just gonna spend a few moments when we're talking about these different variants that are out there and people are saying, well, what does that mean? Uh, it's not, a, we can't really call it a true mutation. I'll show you in just a moment, but what the thing I really wanna help you all understand is that this is not the very same virus we had a year ago. One year ago, and we've done what we call Ancestry.com, what I call that, where we've done the genetic sequencing on, on those viruses uh, from a year ago, the original one we call the wild type virus. Uh, it has now, that, that, came, that actually did come from animals. It jumped from animals into humans. Now, there's still a lot of debate about how that may have occurred, but the most important thing I really want all of you to know is that a year later, here we are one year later, and that particular virus has now changed and the proteins have changed and the spike proteins have changed and it has learned the human body much more efficiently after one year than it did one year ago. So when we're hearing about increased transmission of the particular virus, it's because we keep transmitting it from one individual to another. And that's why we keep asking and telling the public and, we, and, and it's very difficult to help people to understand that we're not just talking about a respiratory virus anymore, as I've shown you tonight. We're talking about a virus that actually has the potential to affect a large number of organ systems in your body, leading to a lot of problems that I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. So when we talk about the variants, again, I, I, this is a, a very busy slide. I apologize for that. But if you take a look in the middle, if you're wondering, how do we know it changed? Well, what they do, they take the genetic sequence, and they figure out and, and they, they compare it to a previous genetic sequence. And then they see, well, what changed and where did it change? And here, this is what we call the Cal-20. So this was one of the viruses that kind of had a variant out in California. This particular one is probably responsible for what led to the havoc in the Hispanic community out in Los Angeles County. But again, I just put it up to help people better appreciate how in science we understand the variants. And also number two, under, help you understand that this virus is changing and the more it transmits from one individual to another, especially if we wind up in some of our immunocompromised individuals, then it gets, has an opportunity to continue to mutate and probably turn into something a little bit more efficiently spread from one human being to another. So I'm gonna uh, switch gears here and begin talking a little bit about the vaccines. And, and I've been putting this slide up for a while uh, and, and so even though it says vaccine clinical trials, I wanna help everybody understand one of the number one questions I get, um, especially from young people, they say, well, it's not FDA approved because it's under emergency use authorization. Well, yes, you're true and you are correct, but I just wanna make sure that you understand what that means. It doesn't mean that it has not been FDA approved. It means that right now, once we determine that any medication is more effective and safe uh, for patients to take, and there's a greater benefit to giving it to people in the midst of a crisis like we have right now at the pandemic, then once we determine that it's safe and effective, then we are going to actually administer that to the public. Now, anytime you have a clinical trial and you, you see here, you see phase three, and then you see phase two and three, uh, every clinical trial going on right now is for a two year period. Everybody that began enrolling in the trials back in, in April of last year, 2020, they are still in the clinical trial now. And we're still following and monitoring all these people. The second thing I want you to pay attention to are the large number of, of people that were enrolled. The only reason we were able to enroll 30,000 people in Moderna, 45,000 people in, in Pfizer, another 30,000 people in uh, the Novavax trial, uh, the Janssen J&J, &J, and we're going to talk about the J&J &J vaccine in just a moment. 40,000 people in, the, in their first one, and they actually have a, a secondary clinical trial going on right now uh, where they're looking at a two-shot strategy in 30,000 people. 
And of course, you know, the AstraZeneca trial had over 30,000 people. And that's just the trials that we have going on. There are other trials going on around the world. The only reason we were capable of having that many people was because we had a pandemic and people were dying and they're dying now. And there were so many people. And so we were able to kind of expedite the amount of data that we could collect during the clinical trial. So we want to assure everybody there were no shortcuts taken. People want to know what's the long-term effect, where well, we understand that. I'm going to address that in just a moment. Uh, I think I can uh, go past that for time's sake. So people also want to know, well, what, if I get the vaccine, what is it going to do to me? Uh, how am I going to feel? I don't want to feel sick. Is it going to make me sick? Well, here uh, we, we show people exactly the prevalence in the clinical trials of each one of the most prevalent things that wound up happening to people. Overwhelmingly, the number one thing that people feel is fatigue. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the number, the number two thing people felt was headache. Now, a number of people went on to have chills and, and, and of course, almost everybody had a sore shoulder at the, at the site of injection. For the Moderna and the Pfizer product, we actually had uh, two injections and on the second injection, and you've already heard it, yes, indeed, many people wind up having a little bit more side effect than they had the first time. But the one thing I want to point out to you for all three of the, um, uh, of the vaccines that we're showing here, and all of this came directly from the FDA submission from each one of the companies. I just kind of took it and retooled it and put it into the slide here. Uh, uh, none of them say 100%. There's no guarantee that anyone's going to feel anything. But the most important thing that we need everybody to know is that if you do begin to feel some of these things that you have here, it means that your body is now building those antibodies. It's pulling energy from your body and it's actually producing those protective antibodies that we showed in those videos early on. And so it's not a bad thing if you have some of these adverse effects and overwhelmingly in all of the clinical trials, most of the side effects only lasted for 24 hours and typically and usually not more than 48 hours, which is two days. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this video uh, to you all. Again, it's just a very brief clip because people are, are really concerned about messenger RNA and they hear messenger RNA and, and uh, Dr. Hill and I, we've heard it all around the world. Um, uh, through some of her contacts, uh, we actually did a presentation early one morning last year about uh, uh, with people over in Nigeria. And they were telling me that even people over in Nigeria were hearing and, and that many of their patients we're saying that the RNA is going to interact with your DNA and potentially it could uh, do terrible things. It could turn you into a whole other animal. I want to assure you that that is not possible, especially with these particular vaccines that we have out there. They do not interact with the RNA. The only thing these messenger RNA uh, vaccines do is to actually program your body to make a particular kind of protein that we have already programmed in. So let me just show this video very quickly. The ribosome is a large molecular factory that translates the genetic code in messenger RNA into long chains of amino acids that fold up into a protein. The gene code is read in groups of three letters called a codon. Amino acids are delivered to the ribosome by transfer RNA and match the gene code in the messenger RNA. Once gene translation is complete, the amino acid chain folds up to create a protein with a three-dimensional shape that determines its function. So part of, part, part of uh, what the, the big conversation we had last evening about the messenger RNA and what's happening, I want each of you, and, and um, I'm, I'm gonna channel the gentleman that, that just, I saw in the, in the uh, Chauvin trial uh, last week. Uh, each one of you, if you, I want you to take a look at your hands and look at the nails, okay, on your hands. And look at the texture of the nail on your hands and then compare that nail on your hand to the texture. Now I want you to touch your ear and or your nose. The cartilage in your ear and nose is actually a little bit different than what is on your nail and your skin. 
and everything else you have. Messenger RNA, and it's much more complicated than what I'm making it right now, but the messenger RNA tells your body how to take proteins and turn them into all of the different things in your body. It's like a computer code. So now we have taken some of that technology and we are now telling your body to produce a particular kind of protein so that we can build antibodies. And so no, it's not interacting with your DNA and it's not interacting with anything else to be perfectly honest. It's just telling your body to do a very specific thing and much like a computer code from a printer, I mean, from a computer to a printer. And after you print something on your printer, that code goes away. And, and when you get injected, especially with the Moderna or the Pfizer um, product, that messenger RNA is gone within hours, okay? I would imagine it's probably gone within, within six, no more than eight hours. Your body has degraded it. It hasn't traveled anywhere. It's in the interstitial tissues inside of your shoulder and then your body degrades it and it gets rid of it. So no, it's not traveling around your body. It's not interacting with your DNA. It's not interacting with anything other than what we needed it to do. But I will come back to that in just a moment. So now I just wanna switch gears and especially for many of our young people and I want you all to be ambassadors if you don't fall into this category of young people that I'm about to share with you uh, for the next maybe seven minutes and then we're gonna get into a Q&A. It's really important to understand that some of the things that are happening right now uh, are the, the long-term effects of what's happening with people that wind up getting infected with, uh, with, with the COVID-19 virus. Here, we have an article that came from a, a journal called Nature Metabolism, where they began to inspect whether or not COVID-19 can lead to people developing diabetes. And again, without going into everything here, some of the most important things I really want you to understand is that in this particular case, it became a type one diabetic. This, uh, the person that they were talking about, the case study that they were giving in this particular article. Normally in type one diabetics and, and down on that table one, uh, where it says GA, uh, GAD65, IA2, ICAB, these are things that I order routinely as part of my medical practice uh, with our uh, Department of Family Medicine when we're looking for reasons why we might have someone become a type one diabetic or even what we call a type one and a half diabetic, another lecture for another day. They were all negative in this individual, but the individual did have positive proteins, I mean, positive antibodies for COVID-19, the IgG. And it was actually the only thing that was positive in this individual. And so it really did harken, why did this individual develop diabetes? Well, we go back and we find out, lo and behold, that you have that ACE2 receptor inside or uh, on attached onto the beta cells of the pancreas. And, and there's speculation, we haven't proven it yet, but there's re research going on all across the world that if indeed enough of that virus attaches onto your pancreas, which is responsible for uh, secreting insulin in your body and it damages enough of the beta cells, that yes, indeed, you may become diabetic because you no longer have the capability of producing your own in insulin. So it's really important to understand. You can see here that at the very end, it's a, as a conclusion, I report indicates that diabetologists should be aware of the possibility of insulin dependent diabetes as an acute complication in patients infected with SARS-CoV-2. Some of the other things that have really come out uh, that we're really, really concerned about are what we call long COVID, uh, uh, long haulers disease, a whole lot of other things. Again, many young people are not aware of this because we're all thinking, hey, you know what? I knew I had a friend, I had a buddy, uh, he or she got infected. They were down for about a week, maybe two. And then after that, they were fine. Well, lo and behold, what we're finding now is that many people that were infected wind up having long-term effects. And um, I just wanna get through the presentation, but I hope I have the opportunity to share with you many of my own patients and their stories and different things that I have told that are just heart-wrenching and very dangerous. So I wanna share that with you. But if you look here on the far right, and you can see the chronic or post COVID-19 effects that wind up affecting so many different people now. And we began detecting this last year, but now that more and more people are infected, we're seeing more and more post COVID-19 symptoms. Again, you see here, uh, fatigue, uh, muscular weakness, joint pain, uh, the anxiety and depression. I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment. Thromboembolism, chronic kidney disease, these are things that are sticking with people long beyond the time that they actually have COVID-19. 
this came out a little bit earlier this year, and it really kind of uh, it opened my eyes in a way that it really helped me understand where the biggest problems were occurring. Uh, this particular article, I know it's very busy, but I just want to bring your attention to the title and then the title on the far left, Age Groups That Sustain Resurgent COVID-19 Epidemics in the United States. SARS-CoV-2 tr uh, transmission is sustained primarily from age groups 20 to 49. Then you go down to the conclusion of the study. And this was a very comprehensive paper. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, it provides evidence of the resurgent COVID-19 um, epidemics in the US have been driven by adults aged 20 to 49, and in particular age 35 to 49. The very same people that are going to the bars and restaurants I just showed you. And so now, and they have single-handedly kept the pandemic going, this age group, 20 to 49. And what's happening, and you can see it on TV up in Michigan and all around the country, the people that are filtering into the hospitals right now are not the older people, it's the younger people who have not had the opportunity to get vaccinated. And so probably two months ago, I was down here in Tampa just telling whoever would listen, saying, look, we need to start vaccinating whoever wants the shot, especially young people, so we can shut down transmission. Well, I think we're seeing uh, the impact of not doing that right now. Uh, let me keep going here just for time's sake. And this is an area really of expertise in the, uh, for Dr. Hill, for Dr. Angela Hill, but now we're also watching people that um, six months out from being infected, all of the psychological problems, okay? The neurological and psychiatric problems that are continuing to manifest themselves in people. Again, if you see the age group right here, average age of 236,000 people, the average age was 46. And in this particular study, when they went back and looked at all these people, one out of three people, one in three had some type of problem. And what kind of problem did they have? And so what I wanna show you here, and this is very important for all of our young people to really understand, uh, the orange line represents COVID-19, and then the blue line represents when they compare, in this case, other respiratory tract infections like the flu. So when we keep hearing people say, oh, it's just like the flu, it's just like the flu, this is stark proof and evidence. It is not like the flu. It is far different from the flu. It attacks more organs than the flu, especially from a neurological and psychiatric outcome. And you can see people that had ischemic stroke from clotting. You can see here intracranial hemorrhage uh, down on the bottom. The thing that really surprised me, I, well, I, I wasn't even aware until I read the article, dementia. More people develop dementia. And anytime you have that separation between the orange line and the blue line, that means it's far, far, far more prevalent than anything that's ever happened with the regular flu or any other respiratory tract infection. And then here on the far right, you see the mood, anxiety, and psychotic disorders one in three people, okay? 33% of everyone that gets infected winds up having a neurological and or a psychiatric uh, outcome. And so the last few moments here, I'm gonna spend just kind of dispelling the notion that we woke up, it was April of 2020, and we said, hey, we need to hurry up and build a vaccine to get out. Well, we have very stark evidence that it was actually during the President Obama administration and we began developing and he invested, and I'm gonna show you in just a moment, he invested in messenger RNA technology. It's really important to understand that beginning back in 2013, it was the Obama administration, again, when they came to him and said, we can't, we have to do better than what we've done in the past. Where they, he invested $150 million into the development of messenger RNA technology, by the way, that was already in development, that was already being studied. And this began in 2013, eight years ago. And so we have to understand that he had not one, but two pandemics that he had to deal with. He had to deal with H1N1 when he first came into office and then he dealt with Ebola. And in both cases, they really could not do much of anything because they did not have any protection. And he came along and it was Obama that actually said that we have to do much better in terms of building a rapidly deployable vaccine to protect people in the event we have another pandemic. And so I'm gonna put politics aside and everything else. We have to give credit to pro the project Warp Speed. It was already sitting on the shelf, ready to go. It's really important to understand that that was happening. 
And also, uh, President Obama, he already indicated back in 2014 that they were telling him that we were going to have another pandemic in the next four to five years, which is exactly what happened. If you go 2014, add on five years, and we have COVID-19. So it's really important to understand. So the very final thing I'm going to show you, and then we're going to get into a Q&A here, is a really simple fact that, yes, indeed, uh, even though we had the most robust clinical trials we've ever had, that now that we've put uh, this, these uh, vaccines out for millions of people, that there are potential effects that are happening. However, I want to make everybody aware that currently and presently, right now, uh, in this country, we have six cases of people that, that, that uh, by the way, did not die, but that did develop very serious clots. We had another 30 or 30 so, almost 40 people over in Europe that developed a very strange type of clots. But I want to make sure that you all understand that it's still equaling one person out of every 1 million people vaccinated. And so we can't, I'm hoping that we don't get to the, get to the point where people are saying, yes, indeed, aha, I told you, we didn't study it right. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. If you've ever seen a commercial on TV for any medication, and when they get finished in the first uh, 30 seconds of that commercial telling you all the great things that that medication can do, they spend the next 30 seconds telling you everything that's bad about it. Very few things that we put on the market to try and treat people do not produce some type of side effect in some people. But the one thing I want to assure all of you is that there is nothing more dangerous about the vaccines than actually getting infected by this virus. And people were asking me early on, they said, hey, you're telling me to get vaccinated. Are you going to get vaccinated? Well, yes, I'm showing you right here. I, when, as soon as I got the opportunity, I was vaccinated. But you know what? I had the benefit, and I'm going to turn my camera off here. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn my camera back on. I'm going to turn my camera back on. I had the benefit of having a really high level of scientific knowledge where I began reading articles back in Mar on March 3rd of 2020 and understanding the science of what is happening with the vaccines. And so, yes, indeed, right now, there does appear to be a challenge. I've been talking about it with my scientists all day long. We've been talking about it and talking about it and, and, and strategizing about what can we do to message it and, and what, who else can we communicate with. And the one thing that I can tell you is that we already have come up with a plausible explanation for what we think may be happening, but it's just opinion. We need more data, but the data is very clear. We know what will happen to you if you become infected. And so, yes, indeed, we want more people to get vaccinated. We need more people 20 to 49 to get vaccinated because if we don't stop the transmission, this thing could potentially mutate into something that becomes far more deadly than what we've already been dealing with. And we don't want that to happen. So Dr. Hill, I'm gonna pause right there and take any questions or comments from our guest here, but I wanna thank everybody this evening for just allowing me to kind of ramble on with this technology. Again, I hope it was very, um, hope it was very visual, okay? Not a lot of words, but very, a lot of movement, a lot of dy dynamism to what we're talking about. So they will help you begin to process a little bit more so that we're not looking at either TikTok or Facebook or, tr or Twitter or anything else for our information at 140 characters at a time or 280 characters at a time, but we're actually getting the evidence of people who are looking at the science every day. Dr. Hill, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you, but thank you very much. Okay, well, great job, Dr. Sneed. And certainly I'm sure everyone learned something new that they hadn't heard on TV or heard um, explained a whole lot more uh, detailed than what you're hearing and, and able to benefit from. So since Dr. Sneed started talking, we've had um, a few others join us and we'd like to welcome them. But I'd also like to take a pause and introduce Mr. Hiram Green um, and another essential part of the We Care team. He serves as our community outreach coordinator and public relations person. Um, and he is certainly loved by the Tampa Bay community as well. So Mr. Green, you can raise your hand this evening and we're so glad you joined us. We also, um, Justine, I wanted to tell you, 
that we're fortunate to have Pastor Ivan Corbin actually on the line tonight. He um, lives in Homestead and uh, just got invited and not sure how he got invited, but I told him we were just so glad to have him. <laughs> and we hope that this is beneficial and something you can carry back to your congregation and or you know other colleagues, family and friends. And we also have Damian Medley, um, who uh, is actually the brother of Pershell Jackson. So we hope that he'll join our groupies. Um, and Damian, wherever you are, we're just so glad to have you here also. So what we're going to do with the Q&A, um, we definitely have several people that have already put questions in the chat. Dr. Austin, Mr. Green and myself, we're gonna we're gonna rotate the questions, um, and so every we had a few to kind of start out. I'll I'll take the first one. So Mr. Wiggins, Ernest Wiggins said, uh, "Why has the one shot J and J negatively affected more women than men?" Mr. Wiggins, I'm so thank you thankful for uh, for you getting that question and. Um... As a professor, I'm going to tell you right now. Normally, we're very, uh, you know, accustomed to giving out like a gold star uh, for uh, to our students. Where you get the first gold star of the evening. Uh, right now, what we believe is happening, especially from the J and J standpoint, is that there's something about the protein shell and/or other components of the vaccine that are actually activating many of what we call the, the, the endothelial or inside the internal portion of the blood vessel. Okay, the internal portion of the blood vessel that is now actually producing uh, antibodies against uh, platelets inside of the body. And so this is pro this could, and we are believing that it could be hormonally driven, hormone driven. And so the estrogen, uh, either whether it come from uh, uh, or estrogen replacement therapy, it could come from oral contraceptin, uh, contraceptives, or theoretically, it just could come from the ovaries of women are probably having some level of, of what we call endothelial activation. I know it's a very long term, but it's a way of saying that uh, it, will, it can produce an effect that the body will now turn on certain things. It turns off a certain part of the clotting system and one, in turn winds up leading to further clotting portions of another part of, of the uh, clotting system. And so it's very much uh, very similar to when people go in the hospital and some people, again, we don't know, we can't predict who yet, but when they get heparin, very often, sometimes the heparin that we inject in the people to prevent clots can actually lead to um, platelet factors in the body uh, being diminished and therefore uh, leading to antibodies that are uh, binding that leading to what we call disseminated intravascular uh, uh, dissemination or coagulation, I'm sorry, DIC. So we think women are more susceptible. That's why we find it happening in younger women, by the way. And, and, and many women, and probably uh, as they're approaching menopause or in the postmenopausal state, where they have less of the estrogen occurring, are probably a little bit more protected. And that's why we have found it not exclusively, but probably confined to much younger women, not only here in our country, but probably over in Europe as well. And these are, these are the reports I was reading over the weekend from the New England Journal of Medicine. And so. Uh, that's a very complicated way, but we really do think that probably kind of sort of in a roundabout way, it, it probably has a lot to do with um, uh, something that's hormone driven in the women, a little bit more so in, in men. But it's not exclusive to women just yet. We do have, we've had, um, in the report I was reading just before I came on, uh, there was out of 11 people, one of them was a man. So it's not exclusive to women, but probably more prevalent in women for that reason. So thank you very much. So Dr. Sneed, to that point, I was sharing with you as well about um, one case where the gentleman had um, an eye issue and it looked like he had what could look like pink eye. And so I think our messaging there is that people need to also pay attention to the eyes and other parts of the body just to make sure. But also, um, I, I also noticed that on television, they're in, encouraging people to report and let their doctors know if they're having any issues they suspect as side effects, you know, within a, a two week period, particularly of having gotten the vaccine. Absolutely. Let me, yeah, let, yeah, let, yeah, let, me, let me address that very quickly. Um, 
because uh, with, with one of our other internal medicine, actually an emergency room physician that, uh, con that we, I was corresponding with today and he was asking me questions and I was giving thoughts back. Um, you know, we, we, he, he began saying, you know, it, you know, what's happening right now, it could become a confounding factor, especially from a term in terms of headache, okay, and other pains. And I told him that uh, according to what we think is probably going on, excuse me, it's probably going to take you know, anywhere from five to seven days. And right now we're, we're talking primarily about the Johnson and Johnson and or and or the AstraZeneca, which is not here in the United States. Uh, we're probably talking more about those two, but you know we, we're not going to exclude anything at this current moment. But it's probably going to be about a week out, and so the headache that people are getting in that first 24 to 48 hour period, if it happens right there, that's probably the normal side effect that people are getting. But if anything begins to happen abnormal from uh, from seven to 14 out to 20 days, and you begin to feel uh, like you have uh, having a pain internal here. Uh, because there's a part of a, a, a splenic vein here that we have to be concerned about that's developing clots, or you have a really uh, weird headache, then yes, indeed, we need you to, or if you have um, pain in your lower extremity, in your legs, we want you to go and get checked out immediately. But we have to also keep in mind that we're talking about at this current moment, less than one person per 1 million people who have been vaccinated. So we don't want to create hysteria. We don't want to go out and, and, and create panic. Uh, we don't want people saying, oh my God, you know, I, I had a family member today that is rather young and, and her mid to late 20s said, I just got Johnson and Johnson, you know, should I be worried? I said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. You're fine. We don't want to create panic, but we do want to create awareness. And we're looking at it and I'm sure hopefully we're going to have an answer pretty soon. Thank you. Well, Dr. Austin, would you like to take on the next question? <laughs> Yes, I'm muting myself here. We do have a question from Ivan Corbin, who you mentioned just a, a bit ago. And the question there is, have there been any people, Dr. Sneed, who have been discovered to actually have natural immunity to this virus? Uh, Dr. Corbin, um, well, Mr. Corbin, I don't know if it's Dr. Corbin, but, but you know what, we give doctoral degrees away to everybody around here. Uh, I, I, I've given um, um, Pastor Dr. Uh, Hiram Green, so many titles, uh, you know, sometimes he's Pastor Green, sometimes he's Dr. Green, and I call him Pastor Dr. Green, but um, the natural immunity, and again, in that very first or second video I showed, if you were to become infected with the actual virus, your body is going to make an attempt to build its own antibodies to the virus, and we have a large number of people that, that that's exactly what has happened with them, okay? They build antibodies, we can detect the antibodies, and they probably have a measure of protection uh, after they've been infected if they don't have other complications. So yeah, that's the natural immunity. There is not a natural immunity that I'm aware of that can actually prevent that, that virus that if it gets into your body from attaching onto uh, that ACE2 receptor in your body, if that's what you're saying. So there's not a preemptive immunity that I'm aware of. Now, I will tell you, there is a version of it even though we're talking about the COVID-19 virus, okay? The SARS-CoV-2, coronaviruses have been around forever. As a matter of fact, 10% of people that have the flu or a common cold probably actually have a version of it of an older coronavirus that over time has weakened and is now no longer what we call virulent or dangerous that winds up uh, just causing common respiratory symptoms that go away within five to seven days. Well, and we think some of those individuals have a version of what we call T-cell immunity, that if they encounter another coronavirus, another virus in that family, that they may have an early head start. And so that is another version of what you're talking about in terms of natural immunity. But what the pandemic has taught us is that even if that had been occurring prevalently uh, that T-cell immunity has not been enough to ward off this COVID-19 virus. So uh, th th that's a very complicated uh, answer to your question, but uh, your body has the ability to build its antibodies, but very often the replication factor for the virus can outrun your body's ability to build antibodies quickly enough to protect you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Snee. Mr. Coven gave you a thumbs up if you saw that. <laughs> oh, I'm giving him a thumbs up. <laughs> All right, so now we'll let uh, Pastor Dr. Green ask the question. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hill. Okay, this is a question from Mrs. Whitlow. It says, since the vaccines will not be available to children under 18 until later this year, what recommendations do you have for the multi-generational households to stay safe from COVID? Um, the, the first thing that we need to do is get everybody else vaccinated. That's number one, okay? So if there are people, uh, and, and by the way, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, you can go down to age 16 and get that today, okay? Uh, it has been approved by the FDA under the EUA uh, down to 16. But if you have people who have not been eligible up until now, we need to get everybody else vaccinated. Now, that's what I call mini herd immunity. Okay, so if everybody else is vaccinated, at least while they're in that enclosed area, okay, in that multi-generational household, we can um, be assured, we can have a little bit more assurance, not 100%, but we can be more assured that individuals are not going to be spreading the virus because they are now immune to it because of their vaccination. And right now, uh, as you all may be aware, Pfizer has now uh, they're, they're preparing to submit to the FDA to request uh, people down to age 12. They have data down to age 12 to be vaccinated. My estimation and the people I'm talking with nationally, uh, we kind of anticipate that you're probably going to wind up having that uh, approved in, in late May, early June, sometime probably prior to the school year. So that's number one. Number two, we still need uh, children wearing that mask. If people are not gonna get vaccinated in that environment, I, I have shown you the proof tonight of what can happen that one individual in that household can aerosolize the virus and put it out there. And by the way, for young children, there's a condition called MISC, multi-inflammatory syndrome in children that winds up causing a very severe, it's not quite as bad as what we see on TV with the respiratory, but uh, very severe inflammatory conditions, uh, skin conditions, joint conditions. Some of them do wind up developing respiratory uh, conditions in the lungs. Um, and, and so it's not like they are not going to have a problem. Uh, it's not as likely that they're gonna have a problem, but they potentially can have a very serious problem. So we need to keep people wearing a mask. And by the way, we're, I got vaccinated back in December and I've worn my mask every day since that time period just to make sure that I'm practicing good public health techniques. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sneed. So Maisie Ferguson asked, um, once someone has COVID, what preventative measures can they take against the clotting you mentioned? There's, there's a second question, additionally due to the uptick in clotting, do you know if there's also been an associated increase in strokes in individuals that otherwise would be expected to be at a low risk for strokes? Uh, on question number two, absolutely. Uh, and that's part of what we were showing tonight. Um, mm -hmm. The stroke potential for people getting infected with, with, co with uh, co by COVID-19, okay? The stroke potential is higher uh, because you can develop clotting, especially if you fall into a category of having diabetes, high blood pressure, or if you fall into the overweight category. Part of those inflammatory proteins I talked about can rev up it can lead to that clotting, especially in the vasculature, either in the arms or in the lower extremity. Some of that can travel and they can actually uh, have the very same thing happen in the brain, leading to ischemic stroke. And I showed that on that other slide. Uh, that's number one. Now, going back to the preventive measures about the clotting, uh, that, that, to be honest, that has been a controversy that's kind of gone back and forth. Uh, some people have recommended that, you know, you, you can take an aspirin every day to try and prevent that clotting from occurring. Some other people have said, no, you shouldn't do that. And so I'm not sure that we have a clear consensus about that. But I think the most important thing that people can do if they've actually been infected is to try and um, uh, do, do all, the, all the things that we would normally do for, for any other respiratory infection. You know, stay hydrated, get some rest. Um, even though, you know, it's not a direct cure, uh, you know, many people say, you know, go ahead and take zinc and vitamin D and other things. Uh, these are not direct cures, but they are supportive of the immune system and trying to hope and try and get your body to get to a point that you can uh, overcome 
uh, the virus? And so those are very good questions. And, and uh, Dr. Hill, I, I, just, I just have to mention that uh, Dr. Ferguson, uh, he, he tends to wear red and white the same way I do. Oh, I, I, I just I just wanted mm. you to know that. Just, just so you know, uh, I just wanted you to know. But that's a very important question he's asking, especially on number two. You know, and and to comment on another case example, I have a family uh, member who developed clots. You know, about eight months after, well, almost a year even after having COVID infection, and um, so it is that the long haulers that you were talking about, Dr. Snead, is very real. Um, but this person was able to go on and get the vaccine, but has unfortunately endured some complications. Um, and so, uh, one of one of the things that I know was important for that particular family member is, you know, to pay attention to uh, maintaining the, her chronic problems. And so high blood pressure being one, weight, you know, so I do think in terms of prevention and some measures that should be taken into consideration, we have to remember to help people to manage their, you know, regular medical problems um, at best. And, and certainly we're past all the quarantining and that kind of stuff, but as much physical exercise as, as possible possible, you know, would be helpful too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just want to make another point here. Uh, and, and again, uh, you know, we're transitioning our, our, our presentations now to younger people. Uh, you all are the, really the kind of the first ones we're doing it with. Um, but when we find uh, the impact of health disparities over a long, over many decades, um, uh, Black and Brown people, uh, African American, Latino, Oh, by and large, we have found a higher prevalence of those chronic cardiovascular conditions in the communities of African American and Latino descent. Again, especially high blood pressure, uh, especially diabetes. And, and, and so uh, one thing that we did early on was to try and make sure we reached out to as many people as possible to try and make sure they were taking their medications, eating properly, uh, so that we could try and control those conditions. I have a patient and I'll be very careful not to have any identifiers tonight uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to, I'll share these little nuggets with you of my own patient panel. A uh, patient that falls into the overweight category uh, significantly has been diabetic. Her blood, her uh, diabetes condition has been so well controlled. She became infected, wound up in the hospital um, uh, for, uh, for about a week, uh, came out and is doing pretty well. And we attribute that to the fact that she was able to control her diabetes. And, and because we've had other people that didn't control their diabetes very well and had terrible outcomes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Dr. Hill. We need to have people do everything they can to control these mm -hmm. other factors, okay? H high blood pressure, uh, elevated blood glucose and blood sugar levels, uh, mm -hmm. trying to do what we can to exercise. Um, by the way, physical activity can help knock down some of those inflammatory proteins. So we need all of that to begin to occur um, to try and do further things to protect us against bad things happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, went, I went back, you know, I saw a question I think that we, we may have uh, missed over with uh, Purcell Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, will, the, will the virus yeah. eventually start to mutate to get to, uh, mm -hmm. to get around the barrier built by the vaccine? Mm -hmm. We are concerned about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very proud to tell you that just today a report came out uh, and as you're, hopefully you're hearing that uh, there's constant reading and evaluation of the literature and research uh, that goes on by me and the people around me. A report came out today that really does kind of begin to help us understand that the current vaccines are currently and presently uh, active and uh, against the majority of the variants that are out there. Okay, they have not fully escaped. That's a very technical question uh, about why that is. And we can talk about it if we have time. I want to get through all the questions. But however, um, if we keep transmitting, if we keep that transmission going, the opportunity for it eventually to probably um, uh, become a variant and mutate into something more dangerous or more transmissible than what we have today can get to the point where it may escape the current vaccines. And so that's why we're working so hard to try and get as many people vaccinated as quickly as we can. We are literally in a race against time. Whoever is not vaccinated by June 1 of this year, I feel will be at enhanced risk of having a problem with COVID-19. Because by that time period, the entire economy is going to open up. There will, it, it, everything is going to open. We, we can't afford to keep it closed anymore. But the virus will not be gone by that time period. 
And so that's a very important question, Ms. Jackson. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm, I'm, okay, I, I'm, I'm, cut, I cut off Mr. Green. There was a second part to Mrs. Whitlow's question, Ms. Uh, so I apologize, Mr. Green. <laughs> that's okay. okay. The, second, <laughs> the second part of her question is, uh, do you believe college should enforce vaccine mandates on students to achieve herd immunity? If so, what should international vaccinated students do if their vaccine isn't authorized in the US? Will they be fully protected? What about if vaccines isn't available to them in their respective countries? Yeah, Ms. Whitlow, I, I can tell you right now, you must have been in my meeting at 8.30 this morning. Uh, you, you must have been there, I'm sure you were. Uh, as a university, we were having that exact uh, discussion today. Number one, about our international students. Uh, we're trying to get to the point now where, where um, we want to vaccinate as many of them as possible. Number one, it's going to be very difficult for them to leave if they need to leave and get on the airplane and travel. Okay. Uh, the vaccine passport is not popular here in the United States, but it's becoming far more popular around the world. And so we're trying to get them vaccinated, number one. Number two, about the mandate for universities. Um, that's a two-part answer. Number one, uh, many universities right now uh, across the country have already indicated that, th that their students must be required to have it. Um, I'm going to question whether or not every university is going to wind up doing that. I know here in the state of Florida, uh, we might run into particular challenges uh, because of our political uh, climate uh, that may not want that to occur and, will, and may strongly discourage that from occurring. But we're hoping that enough people, to be perfectly honest, will actually adhere uh, to the recommendation of getting vaccinated so that we can protect the entire community, the college community, so that we can kind of create our own herd immunity, both here in the college campus and surrounding areas. But it's not going to be uncommon. It may become mandated. And uh, Ms. Whitlow, I, uh, I'll just share this with you as well. Um, on my own, I did go and talk to very, very high level um, uh, certified HR experts, uh, one that's in my family. And uh, the federal government currently does have the ability to enforce and make everybody uh, in their work environment become vaccinated if they choose and deem it, it, it to be a, um, a health risk to their company. However, in order to be able to enforce that federal law, we believe right now that the drug must be fully 100% FDA approved and not under the EUA. And so it's gonna be pretty interesting to watch that unfold and, and see how quickly potentially the FDA may go back and review all of that data over the past um, um, 18 month period and try to figure out whether or not they're gonna go for uh, full approval before the fall. But uh, that's a very good question, Ms. Whitlow. Thank you very much for asking that. I think I addressed everything that she had on there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Dr. Austin, you want to ask the next one? Okay. Um, I'm looking at a question from uh, Maisie Ferguson, who has asked, uh, once someone has had COVID, what preventive measures can you take against this clotting that we talked about earlier? Are there any? I and then... Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I think I think I think we got that one from uh, from from Dr. Ferguson. Um, yeah. Oh, you know, I want to send a shout out. I, I think yeah, uh, Miss Whitlow. I just answered her question. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you doing, Miss Whitlow? I had to think about it for a minute. Hi, Dr. Sneed. I'm well. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, I, I I appreciate you being on tonight. It's my pleasure. I'm just glad that you're having this open forum because, again, there's so much information happening with COVID. As we all know, it's just constantly evolving. And I'm just glad people like you are staying on top of it to keep people like us informed. So thank you for your service. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm listening. Next, next question. Next question. So I think she actually did have a second one. Um, she was asking how long after you got the, you test positive for COVID, would one expect to see a positive PCR test result? Uh, well, you, you, won't, you, you shouldn't have a, a positive PCR, okay? Mm -hmm. at, at, well, okay, let me back up, let me back up. 
after you've been infected, right? Not not vaccinated. She said test if after you test positive for COVID. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. How long after that will you expect to see positive PCR test result? That's been a very, very, very tricky, tricky answer. Uh, yeah. sim simply because, you know, the PCR, what we believe winds up happening in many people. And if you notice the CDC, they actually recommended after about a 10 to 14 day period that, that people can actually go on with the rest of their, their, their lives. They feel that by that time, the, the virus is no longer replicating in that individual. And if it is replicated, replicating continually by that time, they probably are immunocompromised. They probably know it and they're probably much more ill and too ill to continue on with their regular life. Now, having said that, uh, we, we have encountered people who are no longer infectious, that are no longer, um, no longer ill, but we believe that the PCR is now detecting dead virus or what we call shedding virus, okay? Because remember, you had a lot of copies of that virus. And so when you do the, piece, the nose swab and you're detecting it, uh, very often, um, you know, sometimes we know that they're not infectious anymore, but you're still detecting it on PCR. And so, but by and large, um, we find that by a 30 day period, most people are not positive anymore. And, and, uh, and, and so for people who are continuing to test positive at that point, uh, what we probably recommend is to go and get an antibody test. And we don't recommend antibody tests for everybody. I know that's been a number one question that people have all the time. Uh, but you probably want to go and get an antibody test to figure out whether or not that individual has built antibodies to IgG, by that time, IgG antibodies, and to figure out, you know, do you have antibodies? And, and if you have that, you're probably protected. If you don't have it, then you, we need further evaluation that gets a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. I will also share with you, I was, uh, we, we had, a, we had a, uh, a student here at the university. I'm just going to leave it there. And um, that individual... Uh, they were, they were, they had symptomatic head cold symptoms and we thought, oh my gosh, you know, another positive test. And we, they went and had a, a COVID test. It came back negative. They had a flu test that came back negative and everyone's scratching their heads saying, what are we looking at? And then back to Mr. Corbin's question and, and my response back to him, Dr. Hill, we actually found that this individual had one of the older non-virulent versions of the coronavirus, an old coronavirus that causes the common cold. Oh, oh okay, okay. Okay, okay. so not, not COVID-19. Wow. But an older version. And so that was a head scratcher because we were thinking, well, how much more of that might be floating around the university? But, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but it didn't produce anything negative. It produced regular viral symptoms that we would expect from, you know, from, from the rhinovirus or the common cold. So, um, uh, you know, you know, that's a very complicated question around PCR detection, antibodies, and, and so on and so forth. And it's all because of that ability, uh, the potential ability to continue to shed uh, the, the, the viral capsule the, uh, uh, of, the, of the dead virus and, and detect that it's still present, but it's not replicating. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, um... Dr. Nkimbo had to leave. He sent a message, but he asked a question that I think everybody could benefit from. He said, since experiencing a side effects are a positive sign that your body is building immunity for protection after you're vaccinated, does that mean the vaccine will not protect you if you don't experience any side effects after you're vaccinated? Absolutely not. That's why uh, when I was showing the, at the, the adverse effect profile, I made the comment that what we don't find are 100% of people have any side effects. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any side effect, you are just one of the very fortunate people, depending on which one it is. Um, typically and usually about 30 to 35% of people on the second shot uh, are probably going to have, have some, some type of adverse effect. Uh, if you happen to have the Moderna product, um, uh, upwards of uh, like around 60% can have some adverse effect anything at all. It doesn't mean it didn't work. It just means that you were one of the fortunate people that didn't have any side effects. But no, you are protected. And the only people that we ever have a concern about are people who are known to be immunocompromised from the very beginning and their ability, not for the vaccine to cause a problem, but whether or not they will have the ability to form the, the really robust antibodies that the vaccine can offer. 
And for those individuals, the recommendation is that if, if they do, you know, we want them vaccinated and all of the rheumatologists and other people who are working with them are telling them to, yes, go get vaccinated. We want you to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. But even with that group, if they become infected, they are the ones that we want to go and get the monoclonal antibody therapies, okay? And, and, and what I'm gonna call almost the polyclonal antibodies, um, uh, there's a combination uh, cocktail, if you will, of the monoclonal antibodies that it has, has shown to be the most effective right now. But um, we still want them to go and get that, but, but that's a very important question he, he's asking. And, and I just wanna make sure that everybody here, if you don't feel anything, just say, hey, you know what? Pat yourself on the back and keep moving. You, you had a good day. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm not sure if Dr. Austin froze on us. <laughs> no, I, I'm here. I was just looking at something. One of the things that I was thinking is, Dr. Snead, one of the slides that you put up when you were talking about the trials, when you got to the Novavax, you had, there was USF there, which, you know, indicates some relationship there. And then we have one person who is a participant, Jeff Rock, who says he's in the Novavax trial. So is there anything that you would, you know, be able to share with us about that Novavax trial and what your impressions are about um, its, its effectiveness? Yeah, so before we go any further, I just wanna be very clear uh, to everybody that has remained here right now. Uh, yes, I am one of the uh, clinical investigators for Novavax here at the University of South Florida. Um, I've gone through all of their training. I'm part of helping them to enroll people. I've been watching the progress of that clinical trial. So I want that to be fully disclosed before I answer the question. The Novavax uh, vaccine um, currently and presently in terms of what they've been reporting from all of their trials around the world has been shown to be somewhere in that 95% effective range on uh, just like Moderna and Pfizer. That's number one. Number two, Unlike Moderna and Pfizer and unlike AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, uh, they have taken a little bit more of a, a um, kind of more traditional approach to how they manufacture their vaccine. Uh, they have taken uh, portions of the, of the coronavirus and they have grown a portion, not, all, not the entire virus, but the spike protein, they've grown that in, in certain cells, a cell line that we call it. And then they kind of take that, that, that stock and they cut off that stock and then they process it in a very uh, complicated uh, process. And they take those protein, the spike proteins, and they put that into the vaccine. So unlike, your, unlike the other ones where we're trying to get your body to manufacture that, they're just giving you the little red spikes. It's like they kind of went and shaved off the red spike proteins and put that into the vaccine. So a little bit what we call a protein vaccine, a little bit different. Again, you, if you, when you're injected, you cannot get COVID from the vaccine. There is no live virus. It, it doesn't, it's not even the... And, and so uh, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, the, the clinical trials have been robust. Uh, they've been very good. Uh, at this current moment, I'm not aware of any terrible uh, adverse effects either here, um, here in our country or around the world. Uh, but we wanna thank you uh, for actually participating in that clinical trial. Uh, because again, uh, we need as many people doing clinical research because one of the number one questions people are asking, and I, I did a, a, a similar evening uh, with some of our athletes here, and they were asking, well, it hasn't been tested enough. It hasn't been tested enough. And I said, well, it hasn't been tested enough because you didn't come and get in the clinical trial. We need more people getting involved in clinical research and especially people of color primarily. And, and I know the Tuskegee experiment is very scary for people, um, but you have people like myself, uh, Dr. Kismikia Corbett, um, uh, who, who's in uh, Dr. Barney Graham's lab up at the NIH. She helped develop everything. Uh, we have a different level of oversight around the clinical trial process that we've never had before. And so when people keep on bringing up Tuskegee and feeling like they're a guinea pig, no, that happened with that group of, young, of men, they weren't even told that they were being experimented on. We're not gonna ever do that again. And I would not let that happen. None of us will ever let that happen again. We have too many controls along the way to make sure that will never happen again. But we need more people involved in clinical research uh, along the way because we can't, you know, we can't answer the question if we don't have participation. 
And I know people are saying, well, what if something bad happens to me? Well, we understand that. And I understand that because I, you know, I participated. I tried to sign up for them. And, but at the end of the day, the greater good of making sure that we have a safe and effective vaccine, therapeutics, medication, other things can only be achieved if we have volunteers uh, that come in. And we're going to tell you all of the known risk long before you get to that point. And by the way, uh, Dr. Austin, uh, uh, what was the gentleman's name that, that was in? Um... Jeff, Jeff Rock. Jeff Rock? Mm-hmm. You kidding me. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, it's, it's me, actually. Thank Jeff, you. <laughs> Jeff, what, Jeff, Jeff Rock, is that your real name? That is my real name. Oh man, you know what? You get the, you get the second gold star of the night, my friend. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, and thank you for the answer. That was hey, that's the coolest name tonight. Good <laughs> luck. Um, well, thank you. Well, no, thank no. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're we're very high on that particular vaccine. Again, I am an investigator. I want to be very clear about that. I'm not here to promote it. Um, but so far, it has shown to be safe and effective, and, and it does have a, a kind of more traditional type of vaccine feel than, than the messenger RNA technology. But I want to be very clear and let people know the messenger RNA technology has been around for a long time. And I'm going to make a provocative statement here in just a moment. Oh, I'm looking down here in the corner. Dr. Sears, how are you doing? I am great. This is a blessing, by the way. A lot of my friends and family from the Bahamas were having lots of concerns because they were experiencing the Johnson & Johnson side effects. And there was a doctor who was telling them, don't take it. So I was like, let me listen in to see what you're saying. So I'm grateful that I really joined this conversation. This is so critical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to make a provocative uh, statement here in just a moment as we're going to probably close out here soon. I know we've been off for a while, but I'm thankful for you all kind of hanging in there with me and just allowing me to, to share this information. Uh, it doesn't do any good for me to read 375 articles and then not share the information with people. And so uh, I'm thankful for all of you. Uh, the provoc uh, do we have any further questions? Uh, Jeff Rock got me, he, you know, Jeff Rock got me, got me, he knocked me off of my game. Dr. Sneed, he's a reach up staff. So I know that is his real name. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's how we pay him. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah, are we uh, any other questions? I want to make sure we get through through everybody's questions here. That is very important. We do that. Yeah, well, one of the questions I think I could possibly chime in a little bit, but I want to see what you have to say, or or if you want to ping pong it. But um, Prashel asked, is it possible that the virus is infecting the brain and causing amyloid plaques to form, uh, which are causing the neurological effects we're seeing associated with the dementia? I don't know. I'm going to let you take that question, Doctor Hill. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, of course I can answer it, but but you know what? Uh, I, I want to showcase you for a minute because I think I've told you. In the mm -hmm. next half of this year, uh, <laughs> when, when, when one in three people wind up having these neurological problems, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to shift around and I'm going to be your host. Okay. <laughs> uh, because um, because you're, you're, the neurolo you're the neurology person, but uh, why don't you go ahead and take a first stab at that? So um, I didn't get to read the article Dr. Sneed read, but a couple of months back or early fall in the Neuroscience Institute, we were kind of preparing for what we envisioned to be an onslaught of uh, concerns about memory because there were reports about the um, fog associated with the COVID vaccine. And doing a little research, what we realized is that the virus actually enters that nasal passageway and goes through the the olfactory bulb, which is tied to our, our smelling. And that's why people were losing, you know, the sense of smell, but it was riding that little highway and actually um, bypassing um, some aspects of the blood brain barrier and getting into the brain. So now um, can't say just yet, again, Dr. Sneed is going to chime in, but at that point, we had not noticed that amyloid plaques were developing, but there was data or has been data that I probably paid most attention to because one of our pillars in the college is personalized medicine. And that is, we have found that some people with certain genetic uh, makeup, those that have what we call the double E or homozygous mutation for apple E seemed to be at a higher risk. And that that was a pattern we were noticing in a lot of the elderly patients um, 
that were interestingly um, predominantly Caucasian because that's where we typically would see that uh, genetic malformation. Um, and it was a sign of, of late onset you know, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So I have to, you know, in recent talks with our medical director at the Neuroscience Institute, again, we're just bracing to continue doing the testing and um, also entertaining, again, whether or not we should be doing genetic testing as a rule out for patients as we also look at other risk factors. When we talk about dementia, though, I do have to say, because there is just simply a, um, a, cornucopia of risk factors that contribute to dementia. I don't think we'll ever be able to solely blame COVID. Now, is it possible for the plaques to form? I can just tell you 20 plus years of studying Alzheimer's disease, plaques typically start growing as early as age 30 or 40 for people who are prone to it. And so again, as I said earlier, our best means of prevention is to avoid and prevent getting some of the chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and certainly having the strokes and things of that nature, because that sets us up for already compromised blood flow to the brain and other types of dementia in that regard. Um, so we can't solely blame the COVID vaccine that that would be why they got the a dementia. But we do know having the virus in the brain, as with any kind of infection, does affect brain function and that the confusion, um, the disorientation, any memory changes would be very likely because it could subsequently, as Dr. Sneed so eloquently already described, destroy cells in the brain that would normally provide those kind of functions and memory would not be an excuse. Exclusion. And the brain, um, its only protection is really that blood brain barrier. So if you have something that manages to bypass that, then it's a very vulnerable organ like any other organ in the body. So, Dr. Sneed, what would you add to that? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to add anything to it. I think that's exactly okay. what we've uh, uncovered. The olfactory okay. ball pathway uh, was something that was not understood and not well known early on. And I think. Um, I think really the revelation from the from the uh, the, the Lancet uh, Psychiatry Journal article about mm -hmm. dementia uh, really was one thing, but there's multiple types of things that wind up leading to dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a version of it can be, um, uh, you know, ischemic dementia, and there's other components that can occur. So I think it may be a little bit too early. I'm not a, I'm not aware of any PET scanning or anything mm -hmm. else that would actually go through and indicate that we're at, that, that we that we're doing amyloid deposition leading mm -hmm. to uh, that and, and and if that were the cur and if that were the case, but I, you know I can look here just for a moment because I think I just saw something. Um, no, I, I won't be able to find it quickly. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So in that our article, uh, I went back and took a look. Uh, they were indicating uh, not 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 Alzheimer's. Which is very often that, uh, that 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 amyloid deposition result, but uh, they are indicating Parkinsonisms that may be a resultant effect. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think uh, more research and time is going to have to go on. But I'm mm -hmm. I'm kind of expecting that probably in about a six month period we will have had a, a, a more people infected that will mm -hmm. be seeking uh, psychiatric and neurological uh, treatment, leading to more research, and we'll have an answer for that probably uh, in the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, so moving down, you got a lot of compliments, Dr. Sneed, on your presentation. Um, Dr. Nkimbo, uh, Mrs. Sanders, thoroughly enjoyed it, and so just wanted to let you know. Um, we do have a few more, um, Ernest Wiggins, et cetera. Oh, Mr. Mr. Webb brought up another question we've heard before, and then I'm going to let Dr. Austin and Mr. Green ask, and that is, does blood type have anything to do with the severity of COVID-19? Yeah, you know, that's a question that continues to kind of bounce around in the scientific community. Uh, there had been an association with uh, type O, uh, but that has, I don't you know, to my knowledge, uh, I'm not sure that has been proven just yet. Um, mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, again, statistically, you find more people in that category. And so uh, we, we're just not sure. Uh, and, and there's nothing that we can rely upon because we happen to know that, that type O people are dying like everybody else. And mm -hmm. so um, uh, I just want, just want it to be very clear 
that uh, we don't, you know, they have, you know, there's been a general um, association that people have tried to make, but scientifically, I, I will not go out on a limb this evening and, and make that statement to you. Nothing, and I will only make statements that I can back up with evidence uh, for you all to be able to find independent of me ma making the comment. Okay. Christy, uh, uh, Christy, 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 Christy Andre. I, I have typed yeah. it twice. Okay. Good. So, All right. I was going to ask that question. That, that, might be, that might be an answer right there. But, well, listen, everybody, um, uh, I, I think, you know, I think we've come to the end of, of many of the, uh, the questions in the chat. I'm just going to make one more provocative uh, statement for you all to think about and then even go back and talk to people in your community. And I've been, and I kind of test marketed uh, this statement uh, with a whole group of other people before and have found it to be uh, very thought provoking for many people and, and even discomforting. So I'm going to warn you about that. But uh, uh, just for imagine, and I'm typically not one to go off into imaginary land, but I do want you all to imagine just for a moment that uh, COVID-19, the virus, the pandemic has occurred. It has fallen upon the United States and, and, and people uh, uh, were dying at a very at a pretty high rate. They were dying because the COVID nineteen was causing a cancer in the body. Okay, and the cancer was killing people, killing some people, and having other people have very long term effects. Let's just imagine that for a minute. If that were the case, I really do wonder if people would be hesitating to go out and get the cure to that cancer so that they could either cure the cancer or prevent themselves from having it in the future. And when I have put that question out there for people to really think about, overwhelmingly people say, you know what? Absolutely, I would go and get that protection because I don't wanna die from cancer. Well, right now we have to imagine that uh, this is another version of that. We've had 564,000 people in this country die we're probably going to hit about 600,000 people by June 1. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the vaccines are out there to prevent further problems, further neurological problems, further respiratory problems, and further death. And one other provocative um, uh, example I will give all of you, uh, again, being very careful about the patients that I, that I have, because I don't want to do anything identifying but I had a family member of one of my patients, a family member, not, not my actual patient, um, that, that actually contracted COVID, was not severe COVID, just a regular version, did not wind up in the hospital, had the cough, uh, developed a version of the, the pneumonia, but not real severe, uh, got over that. But then a, a little while later, uh, continued to have breathing problems, had to go on permanent oxygen I met this individual about two months ago, um, about a month ago, I found out that that individual, that individual um, has been told by their physician that they had three to five months to live. Three to five, because the, because the COVID scarred their lungs so severely. Now these, we're not talking about an individual that went into the ICU, didn't even really, as far as I can recall, did not even go in the hospital, but needs a double lung transplant because of the, the uh, diffuse scarring that occurred and, and, and cannot, is not eligible for the, for the double lung transplant. And so now has been told that they have three to five years to live. I can go on and on with these terrible stories. I have witnessed it. So when people are telling me that, oh, you know, it's just a flu or, you know, it's a hoax or whatever, I have watched people live it. And that's driving my passion right now. And I'm really afraid. I don't think we're going to have the, the big peak fourth wave uh, that people have, have been talking about because I think we are vaccinating enough people and enough people were already infected and had immunity. But we are going to have another peak, but it's primarily going to be young people. And that group, wh whoever they are, whether they're Caucasian, whether they're African-American, Latino, whether they're man or woman, whether they live in a big city or whether they live in rural America, wherever they are, 
we're gonna six months from now, they're gonna have these long hauler effects. And so we need to try and shut that down now. So that's driving my passion about it. I don't let anything I do with COVID-19 and the presentation I'm giving interfere with my real job that is from 7.30 to 6.30 every day, oftentimes six days a week. But from 6.30 on, I will continue giving these presentations as long as Dr. Austin will let me use her platform. <laughs> She's been with me every step of the way because we need to get the word out. And I know that people are having fear right now about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I know people are fearful about it. I get it. But we really have to think about the fact that the risk benefit is in favor of getting vaccinated. Okay? Because if you get infected, you are now have a one in three chance or even worse than that of having something bad happen to you and take away your quality of life. The metric cannot be whether you live or you die. There's a whole area in between of bad stuff that we don't want to happen to anyone. So I just wanted to kind of get provocative for a moment and, uh, and really really just kind of, kind of uh, make that statement. And right before I get off, uh, I, I, call, I, I mentioned a, a person a little bit earlier, uh, Ms. Whitlow. Um, uh, I, just want, I, I just really want to acknowledge her uh, because uh, she, she's, a, she's a reporter and a journalist for the Black News Channel. Many of you may not have heard of that, but it's one of the fastest rising uh, cable news stations right now across America. And they've been very fortunate. I've been very fortunate to, to, um, uh, to go on and appear on their show occasionally and in and, and that at three to five minute segment, share much of this information because I want to get it out. So I just want to acknowledge Ms. Whitlow very quickly. I'm thankful that she came on. I invited uh, her and, and colleagues from Black News Channel to come on and just kind of hear the other half of what we do in the community and what we've been doing, not only here in Florida, but across the entire country. So uh, thank you, Ms. Whitlow, for coming on. Uh, and I encourage all of you to you know, go and check out this news station. It's one of the best things I felt that's really happening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by the way, it's not just for black people, uh, just mm -hmm. so you know, um, it, it's, not, it's not just for black people because uh, uh, the executive director and president of the American Association of Colleges of the Pharmacy gave me a call early one morning, a, a little bit more than a month ago. Uh, I'm talking about Lucinda Main, mm -hmm. Dr. Hill. Yeah. And she said, Dr. Sneed, I just saw you on the Black News Channel. She was up <laughs> and she was up in the morning working out and looking at TV and watching the Black News Channel. So I just wanted to give that shout out to them. And, and I want to thank her for coming on because ultimately uh, we need to get the word out to the most uh, potentially impacted people. But uh, if there's no other questions, uh, I just want to thank you all. And I think we'll go ahead and shut it down right now. But, but uh, thank you very much. Dr. Sneed, before, before we shut down, I just want to say there was a question from Cynthia Smith and you, with your provocative statement there, I think answered her question in a way that um, we are so grateful. She just talked about, you know, what single piece of information did you think would really make a difference in terms of talking to our young people? And uh, you just said it. Hey, listen, for the young people out there, you all, if, if you don't fall into that young category, you need to go and tell them. And if you do fall in the category, tell your friends, you know, tweet this out. <laughs> we don't want people to have any damage, long-term damaging effects to you. You are not going to return to your normal life or not, maybe some of you will, but many of you won't. And it's just because physiologically, the virus has learned too much about our body and it affects too many organ systems. So yeah, thank you for that, that question and comment. That's one thing I would tell people, take the opportunity to live. And for the young people, take the opportunity to live a good quality of life. One more story, Dr. Austin, before we get off. Um, I, I, know, I have a patient. Well, it's really the family, kind of sort of the patient. Um, 30 years old became infected mildly about a year ago in April, April of last year, lost smell and taste. A year later has yet to regain it. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm hoping that individual does. I'm not gonna give any gender identification. I hope that individual, I hope they do get it back. I want everybody to recover, but the actual fact of the matter is that that individual may never get it back. 
may never again enjoy the taste of good food, the smell of a rose, or cologne or perfume. And so we don't want that to happen. So I, we, we know that people are concerned about this thing going on with vaccines and everything, but we got to take an opportunity to live. We got to almost take the chance to live right now. I can't promise what's going to happen five years from now, but I know the devil that's in front of us today. And it's harmful. So I'm going to stop right there. I can get on the soapbox all night, but I, you know, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and get home to uh, and do my, do my other job, do my third job and, and be a husband and a father. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and my, my, my daughter has some very important news. I know she wants to share with me tonight, so I'm going to be right there to hear it. But thank you all very much. Dr. Sneed, very enlightened program. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, just want, I just want to ask, is there anyone on your panel aware of Burkett Chapel Primitive Baptist Church? Is it can't anywhere? believe it. <laughs> I can't uh -huh. believe it. That's a uh, Barto, by the way. I tell Steve. you to go. <laughs> well, I, 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 the, Brother uh, Green, this is Calvin Glover. <laughs> How you doing, Calvin? Good to see hey, you. Good to hey, see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Pastor Green, I, I didn't hear the question your, all the way. Your, what, was your, the question? Your, what was the response? Your, your illustrious uh, presenter is my Kappa brother also. <laughs> Oh, oh wow. wow. Isn't that interesting? Small world. <laughs> hey, good to see you, Bro doctor, pastor, brother Green. Good to see you in here from here. <laughs> I love it. Good to see you too, Captain. Take care. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight. Well, brother Glover, thank you very much. Yes. No and problem. We very enlightening. Yes, we would like to thank everybody for coming. And if you look in the chat, um, Dr. Austin has placed information on how to reach the YouTube channel for Reach Up. And that's where uh, we have a library of this recording and others to include the program that we did on Tuskegee and Henrietta. So we hope that you too will join Mrs. Jackson and Mr. Webb um, and others and become groupies. Um, we will continue to reach out to you as we have future programming. But if nothing else, please stay safe, continue to follow the CDC guidelines and help us help everybody else um, in this pandemic. So thank you so much. And again, to reach up, we are so grateful for you and all that you're doing to help us be effective in this, in this area. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.